stayed until the very end. Uh, I do realize it's uh, Friday afternoon, late Friday afternoon for many of us, uh, not all. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, so uh, last time I um, introduced the uh, continuum uh, version of the sine Gordon model and uh, just trying to find it. Here it is. Um, so this is um, a model of a field phi, um, which um, lives on, on the two-dimensional um, torus, the way I defined it. So there's a torus of length L. And um, uh, I, um, so I, we think of it as uh, being in the continuum, but uh, I put in a little uh, regularization of a lattice of mesh size epsilon. So in, in practice for us, um, the field is really on, on this fine lattice of mesh size epsilon and uh, uh, width L. And, um, it has a Gaussian free field part, and then it has this periodic interaction uh, with the uh, typical uh, counter terms that, that uh, with a counter term uh, as, as um, well, by now um, we've, we've seen um, uh, here and in, in other uh, cases, um, uh, uh, much simpler than, uh, than what we saw uh, in, uh, in uh, Martin's talk, but um, anyway, there is a counter term here and it does make uh, the potential uh, uh, rather non-convex if you look at it uh, naively. So we see that um, uh, there's the cosine, the cosine is, uh, is non-convex. So the second derivative is between minus one and one. And, um, uh, and we're multiplying that uh, cosine by epsilon by a diverging constant. So it really looks uh, quite non-convex uh, compared to the, um, the term that would make this action convex, which is, oops, this was the wrong, uh, which is uh, uh, this mass term, right? This, this is what would make this action convex. Uh, and uh, the cosine is competing with that and makes it look rather non-convex. Uh, so, so we are um, uh, far out of the applicability of, of the methods uh, for convex um, potentials, but um, what the program is today is we still want to prove uh, the Loxobolev inequality uh, uniform in epsilon. So um, here's the statement, uh, which I recall, uh, we're looking um, at uh, beta up to this threshold of six pi, we discussed last time, and then we fix any coupling constants, any mass, and any size of the torus. And uh, the goal is to prove that there is a Luxobolev constant that is uniform in epsilon. And in addition, that if the coupling constant is small or the mass is large, then in fact, uh, the constant is also uniform in the volume. Uh, okay, so... Um, that's uh, so, th and that's the program for today. So um, last time I began um, explaining uh, how we'll go about this, and and really uh, we'll be using um, uh, uh, an approach that that was uh, proposed in this uh, beautiful paper of uh, Bridges and Kennedy, um, uh, which is. Um, to, um, we'll, we'll be uh, representing the uh, uh, renormalized potential VT, uh, which I recall solves this, uh, this Polchinski equation. Um, uh, we, we want to represent this as a kind of a Fourier series. So it, it kind of looks like a Fourier series. There's a sum and then there's some, something that one might call a Fourier coefficient. And then there are some exponentials with I in there, uh, but it's a Fourier, uh, um, series, if we want to call it this way, that's written in a rather unconventional way for Fourier series in the sense that, um, well, the, the way these coefficients are arranged is, uh, we are, uh, is, is different from usual. So here we're summing over sort of the, the points, uh, well, we're summing over the indices, which are uh, points for us, uh, where the coefficient uh, is is not is one or minus one and so on rather than summing over the values of the different modes. Um, so this is a, if you like, a Fourier series that's uh, well suited for infinite rather than finite dimension. And really, what we saw is that this is basically um, uh, 
a representation or very closely related of, of the Yukawa gas. Um, okay, so, so uh, that's the starting point. And um, uh, so uh, and then we, okay, so the goal is to estimate uh, or to solve this Polchinski equation. Uh, we saw that we can transform uh, that equation into uh, an equation in this uh, Fourier space, as I will call it. Uh, it looks like this, uh, the linear term becomes a multiplication operator and then there's a nonlinear term. And so this, uh, 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 by applying the Duhamel formula, we get an integral equation. And um, this integral equation we also saw has a nice structure in the sense that the n equals zero coefficient is uh, completely explicit. Um, we can solve it. And then the higher ones, um, uh, uh, so v tilde t with uh, arguments from one through n uh, is given uh, in terms of uh, the v tildes with uh, fewer arguments. So here we have n arguments and uh, by, by that Duhamel formula it's given in terms of this integral and these uh, v tildes appearing on the right hand side here, they only depend on at most n minus one uh, variables each. So in particular, since we already know uh, V tilde with one argument, we can just use induction to um, compute them all. Um, um, so that we can always do. Uh, that series doesn't always converge, um, uh, but if it does, it gives a solution to the, uh, to the uh, Polchinski equation. And um, um, that's going to, okay. So, and, and that's what we're going to be uh, show, showing uh, first now. Um, so to this end, let me uh, um, explain a few preliminaries. Um, the uh, Polchinski equation involves these uh, heat kernels, C uh, dot T uh, X Y which I defined as, uh, so was, uh, so remember this was by de definition e to the minus uh, t uh, a uh, x y. And uh, I have chosen a normalization in which um, this a, so I've chosen the, uh, if you like, microscopic uh, normalization in which this a is a unit lattice Laplacian uh, plus a uh, mass term uh, which, uh, scales down with epsilon. So remember there was two points of views. We could either um, think about the continuum with a singular interaction and a continuum Laplacian, uh, or we could think about the microscopic lattice uh, in which the Laplacian becomes a unit lattice Laplacian. And uh, instead the, act, uh, the, um, the interaction became um, uh, small. And, and that's the point of view I'm taking here. Uh, you can, I mean, uh, these are completely equivalent, but we'll just have to fix one, and this is the one I'll be ta taking. So that means um, we have a, a, a lattice Laplacian here. Uh, so unit uh, lattice uh, Laplacian. So we have a unit lattice Laplacian here, and then we have these e to the minus m squared epsilon squared t. Okay. Um, so, um, so this unit lattice Laplacian, well, it, uh, at large distances, it roughly looks like uh, the uh, continuous Laplacian. And uh, I will, uh, um, there's subtle differences, but I will uh, ignore those. And, and uh, um, in particular, it's, uh, it behaves, uh, has roughly like this uh, uh, Gaussian kernel and has uh, dk e to the minus uh, x minus y squared over t. And so here we see that there is a characteristic length scale. Um, which I will call LT uh, for length uh, associated to T, uh, which is roughly a square root T. And uh, um, this is only true if T is at least one because when the unit lattice and nothing happens for, for times less than one for that heat kernel, and then, um, so, so I'm defining this length scale as just square root t, uh, maximum one. And then we also take the minimum with one over m squared epsilon squared, because there's this exponential factor here, which ensures that basically once t crosses one over m squared epsilon squared, that heat kernel is essentially zero. Um, so this is the 
characteristic length scale associated to, to this um, heat kernel, uh, but you should just think of it as square root t. Uh, okay, so, and um, well then, uh, it is an exercise uh, to check that if you look at this heat kernel, on, so ctxx, so that's this heat kernel on the integrated on the diagonal. So this is c dot dot xx ds, that this uh, uh, behaves like one over uh, two pi log uh, lt plus uh, big O of one. Um, and uh, so, so essentially this, this exercise is just uh, uh, up to approximation, the fact that if you take the integral from one to t of one over four pi s uh, ds, this is the continuous heat kernel, uh, what you get is uh, one over uh, four pi uh, log t or one over two pi log square root t. Okay, so, um, and uh, you can also uh, see that if you, if we take the sum over all y of c dot t of x, y, um, sup over x, if you like, uh, this is uh, bounded by, um, uh, in fact, e to the minus m squared t. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's just less or equal to then. Um, uh, because you still have, I guess there's also the epsilon. Um, because we, we still have uh, this factor here and the heat kernel just has uh, sums up to one. Um, okay, um, uh, good. So uh, with that preparation, uh, we can see that if we just look at the Fourier coefficient, so I'll, call it, I'll keep calling these Fourier coefficients, um, uh, with one particle, um, this was given by e to the minus beta over two, ct0, zero, zero uh, c naught, where uh, I recall um, uh, c naught uh, was given, uh, let me, so let's first look at the first term. I'm just plugging, um, plugging uh, this in, All right? So this is, uh, that's that. Uh, so what we get is, um, uh, I'm getting a beta over uh, four pi uh, log L. So this is uh, L to the minus uh, beta over four pi, LT. And then we get the Z naught, which in uh, our normalization was epsilon squared uh, minus uh, beta over four pi. So this was the diversion counter term here uh, times uh, Z. Um, so, um, all right, so, so we see this is really the same as epsilon squared times uh, LT, or uh, maybe let me write epsilon LT to the minus beta over four pi Z. And um, from this you can, um, okay, so, I will argue that a good normalization is in fact to put in an extra factor LT squared uh, next to the VT tilde. Uh, why is that? Well, this VT uh, tilde is the effective potential at scale T. Uh, it will always be summed over uh, points which uh, correspond to a, a ball of that uh, same length scale. So, so that, that, bo that ball has volume LT squared. So it's just the definition for now. I just, I just gonna put, um, LT squared everywhere. Um, uh, so that makes, uh, so one, if I do that, uh, so we get a two here and the whole thing now just becomes uh, uh, this, it becomes epsilon uh, to the uh, well, epsilon LT, uh, to the power two minus beta over four pi times z. So in particular, this interaction, which started out singular, uh, we have this epsilon to the minus beta over four pi. If we normalize with respect to this natural length scale, uh, LT, and so you'll see that this is the natural uh, normalization. It, it doesn't look singular anymore. It, uh, it looks like epsilon LT to the two minus beta over four pi, which will be uh, small, 
uh, as long as uh, LT is less than one over epsilon. Um, but what is uh, LT uh, is one over epsilon? Well, LT you can see here is, oh, this should be, uh, there shouldn't be a square here. LT is always less than one over epsilon, or at least one over M epsilon. So, so this quantity appearing in this normalization will always be bounded. There's no singularity anymore. Um, well, it's, um, well, it's still singular in the sense that it doesn't scale like just uh, two. So there's still uh, this, uh, this, this term here, uh, but, uh, but normalized in this way, it's always bounded. Okay. And I, I will call the right-hand side, um, we'll give it a name. Uh, I'll call this um, ZT, uh, and um, uh, I'll call this maybe the microscopic renormalized coupling constant. It's uh, the um, size, uh, it's uh, from the macroscopic point of view, um, uh, the um, the relevant size of the interaction. And so we see it, it remains small uh, for quite a long time, uh, which is uh, as long as LT is, uh, so remember LT starts, e being e starts at one uh, or at zero, uh, but effectively one, that's, that's the unit lattice spacing. So then this is really tiny, the right-hand side, it's epsilon to some power. And then the length scale, once we go to bigger and bigger length scales, it becomes bigger and bigger until we reach the macroscopic scale, which is one of epsilon, and then this becomes one. But for all the scales before, it's, it's tiny. Uh, okay, so um, with this in mind, we can now um, uh, prove um, uh, this. So this is in, uh, and this is essentially in this paper by uh, Bridges and Kennedy. Um, uh, if beta is less than four pi, um, uh, then for n uh, greater or equal to two, so before, so here, remember, so here I, I've looked at n equals one, right? So we're interested in the other ones. Uh, I'm normalizing in the same way. Um, Uh, so psi one, oh. so sup psi one, sum over psi two up to psi n of uh, v tilde t of uh, psi one, psi n. Uh, this uh, I'm claiming is bounded by um, n to the n minus two times some constant, which depends on beta to the n minus one times this, what I call this renormalized coupling constant to the power n. Um, um, okay, and so remember here these psi's are position and charge of a, of a particle. Uh, okay, so, so we're gonna prove this. Um, the proof is, uh, is um, is is not difficult. It's uh, we proceed by induction. Um, so we assume bound holds for uh, for uh, well k less than n. So take the same uh, equation, replace n by k, and assume it holds for all k less than n. Um, well then. Uh, we have that uh, V tilde T from psi one up to psi N is, well, remember it was given by an explicit formula, which I, it was given by this formula here, right? So, uh, so V tilde uh, psi one up to psi N is given by this formula. Now in this formula, the first term is uh, less than or equal to one. Um, uh, this is because this uh, WT minus WS, which I guess appeared on a, even on a slide before, well, it's, uh, it's essentially a quadratic form here. You see, uh, where, where is it? Here, you see it's the quadratic form with a positive definite 
uh, kernel. So this is this w uh, dot t is is positive. So is uh, w t minus w s, which is the integrated uh, kernel from s to t. So this is positive. So so this thing is less than one. So we can get a bound by just dropping that that term. So this is a crude bound. And in fact, it's only enough uh, under this assumption beta less than 4 pi. But there it's enough. So we can be extremely crude and, um, uh, and drop, um, drop that exponential term and get uh, bound from. So this is bound by the integral from 0 to t. And then we have the sum over these uh, subsets, uh, i1 this joint subset I2 is uh, J and I1 and K and I2. And um, um, we have this uh, U dot S of uh, Xi J Xi K. So remember this, uh, this notation U dot S, uh, this was just uh, the charge of particle J and particle K. And then there's this uh, heat kernel uh, up to scale s or position x j x k so that that was that's just the notation um, and so maybe I should have just written it out so let's just do that um, and then we have um, uh, v tilde uh, s of uh, xi i one and v tilde s of xi i2. And so here, i1 and i2 are both subsets uh, of, uh, of the interval from the discrete interval from one through n. And so xi i1 is, is this vector xi restricted to the indices in i1. Uh, OK, so, um, so this is a crude bound, which we just got by dropping the exponential factor. Um, so um, we want to take the. Uh, supremum over xi1 and sum it over uh, all the other particles. And what we see is, so this is in bounded by the integral. So these sigmas are just plus minus one. Uh, we can uh, drop them. Uh, uh, so they will not matter. Um, then there is, um, maybe I should have taken that sum out. So these uh, uh, subsets I1 and I2, they, they have some size, which I'll call K. So K is, let's say, the, uh, it's not the same K as there. So maybe let's call it M instead. So M is the uh, length of uh, I1. And uh, well, N minus M is the length of I2. And since both of them are non-empty, the this sum is running from 1 through n minus 1. And then we take uh, the number of uh, choices of these subsets. Uh, and then we have the integral from 0 to t. And we need to take the sum over all n uh, particles. So, so remember here, there is uh, x, uh, i, sigma i. Uh, we need to take the sum over all particles uh, here and there. Um, now, um, and supremum over one. We take the supremum over one particle and the sum of all the other ones. Now, you can convince yourself that what happens is that, so I'll call this, this combination sup and then all the sums. I'll just call this the norm of V tilde, maybe N. Um, so what happens is we just get the norm of C dot, which means uh, uh, soup over first argument, sum over the second argument, or the other way around. It's symmetric. Um, and then uh, we do the same with the other ones, except here we have to put in uh, an M. And in the next one, we'll have to put in an N minus M. So you can convince yourself that um, once you take the soup, uh, you, can, you can, using L1, L infinity bound, arrange it such that uh, you can bound the whole thing by putting a soup on each one of the three arguments and the sum on all of the remaining arguments. OK, so now by assumption, um, the C dot S was the heat kernel, which uh, in this norm 
fix one argument, sum over the others. That was just the, the fact that the, bounded by one by the fact that the heat kernel is a um, is a um, uh, is normalized, and then we had this additional uh, factor due to the mass. Um, and for the other ones, uh, we can use the inductive assumption to see that each of these, so this one, for example, is bounded by m to the m minus 2 times c uh, beta to the m minus 1 uh, times uh, z t to the m. Uh, I guess it's a z s now. And the same with for, for, for this one, right? Uh, Okay, so um, once we, uh, okay, so, so next what we can do is we can take all, uh, okay, so let's bring this to the other, to the next page maybe. Um, oops. Uh, okay, so so we can see that this is bounded by, um, we get a big sum. Uh, so maybe there was a half here as well, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so first we have a sum, which is this sum from m is equal to one through n minus one over n m. Uh, uh, and then we have m to the m minus two and uh, n minus m to the n minus m minus two. So that is the inductive assumption uh, for, for these uh, prefactors there. Uh, then we have these constants C beta to the power um, uh, N minus two, because well, N pl M plus N minus M is equal to N, but there's two minus one, so we get a minus two there. And then we have the remaining integral from zero to T of, and what, what's left is ZS uh, to the N, uh, multiplied by ls to the minus uh, four ds. So why is there a minus four here? Uh, well, there was there should have been one on the on the previous uh, display as well, and um, so ls minus two for each of them. And that's just because in the inductive assumption I put this on the left hand side, so uh, I didn't have it there. So I have to equivalently uh, uh, take uh, the lt to the minus two on the right hand side. So that's that. Uh, okay, so um, now uh, let's look at uh, basically this. So let me go, go back to black. So let, let's look at this integral and this sum separately. So the first sum uh, you can bound uh, just as follows. Uh, uh, certainly, um, this is bigger than uh, replacing the m minus twos by m minus ones. And then it's a combinatorial exercise to see that this is in fact equal to two n minus one uh, times uh, n to the n minus two. Anyway, so there's a combinatorial factor which you can bound by, uh, by this basically two n to the n minus, basically by two n to the n minus one. Uh, and then we have the other integral and I'm claiming uh, that this is bounded by uh, one over n times uh, ZT to the uh, N times uh, LT to the minus two. And so this, this bound uses that beta is uh, less than four pi. This is where it comes in. Uh, and N is uh, greater than two. Um, so let's uh, just see how, why that is true. Um, um, so what do we, so what is that? Uh, so it's basically, it's just computing an integral, right? What is the integral we want to compute? Uh, well, the integral we want to compute is LS to the uh, minus uh, beta. So remember, let me remember the definition of ZS, right? So ZS uh, is defined as uh, Z times epsilon L S to the two minus beta over four pi, right? That, that was uh, the definition from the, um, 
on one of the previous slides. So that, that we want to, uh, so we basically need to integrate LS to the two minus uh, beta over um, uh, four pi. Um, and then we have these, uh, this factor LS to the minus four as well. So what do we have? So we have LS uh, to the power, um, uh, take, forget about the factor epsilon for the moment, uh, to the power two uh, minus, should be black, two minus uh, beta over four pi uh, multiplied by, um, uh, by n. And, and then uh, there is also um, a factor ls to the minus uh, uh, four uh, ds. Um, so if I unpack what this means, remember ls uh, is essentially, um, uh, square root s up to uh, unimportant differences. So let me not worry about those. Um, so this is just the integral of s to the one minus uh, beta over eight pi n minus two ds. And now you can see this integral, uh, well, well, this one, uh, I hope everyone will be able to evaluate this integral. Um, uh, right, it's the, um, uh, but what do we observe? Well, we observe that uh, something happens if, if we assume that beta is less than four pi, then this first prefactor, this first term in the exponential there, so beta is less than four pi, then this is greater than, um, uh, than a half. And since we also assume that n is greater than two, this whole thing is greater than one this uh, this first uh, so this is greater than one uh, for let me it's greater than one under this uh, uh, this assumption here uh, so if it's greater than one well then we see um, uh, this integral uh, is integrable, right? Because there's an s to the minus two, which could cause problems at zero. But if this is bigger than one, it's okay. And this is where this assumption played in. Uh, so under this assumption, so this is uh, n is greater than two and beta is uh, less than four pi, strictly less than four pi. Uh, this whole integral is bounded by some constant uh, divided by n, because if you integrate, you also get a one over n here, and then you get a factor of t, uh, which uh, is t to the one minus beta over eight pi n minus one. So you lose from, goes from minus two to minus one. And this is exactly uh, one over n times lt to the two minus um, beta over four pi um, times lt to the minus uh, times n lt to the minus two. So uh, anyway, so this is exactly this bound. If you uh, remember again that the zt has has factors of l in it. I mean, it's it's just the factors of l here. Okay. So this, uh, if if you didn't quite f uh, follow this. Uh, the computation, uh, never mind. I mean, this, this is the result and uh, uh, it's, it's a simple exercise. Uh, and at this point we realize we're done. Uh, why is that? Um, may not be apparent because my slide is a mess, uh, but um, if we, um, copy this to the next slide. Uh, and clean up a little bit. So this is intermediate step. We don't want that anymore. Uh, so we see that the whole thing is bounded by uh, um, uh, n to the n minus two that's coming from here. Uh, and then there is uh, uh, some constant which was taking to the uh, power n minus two there. We, it now goes to the power n minus one because we're picking up some other constant elsewhere. And then we get a zt 
to the uh, to the n and also an lt to the minus two, uh, which is okay because this is going to go to the other side. And so this is the the conclusion of the proof. Uh, so end of proof. So let's go. Let's quickly go back to the statement to remember. This is what we've just proved. Uh, um, so these estimates for these v tilde um, t's. Uh, all right. So um, and um, um, so what can we see from that? Well, we can see from that that uh, under the following conditions, the so remember ultimately we're interested in this function v t of phi, which was if you remember defined as a sum over n. And then we had uh, maybe one over n factorial. And then we had the sum over psi one up to psi n. Uh, and then we had these v tilde t's of uh, psi one up to psi n e to the i square root beta sum i goes from one to n phi x i sigma i. All right, so this is the function we're ultimately interested in because uh, we, um, uh, we saw earlier that uh, if this uh, series on the right-hand side converges absolutely, then this Vt of phi is actually a solution to the Polchensky equation. And what we've just, the estimate what we've just proved uh, allows us to uh, get this under, under condition. So if beta is less than four pi, and uh, uh, t is such that uh, this constant C beta times uh, Zt uh, is less than one over e, uh, uh, then in fact the series converges, um, absolutely. Um, and gives the solution to the Polchensky equation. Uh, and moreover, uh, uh, we can get estimates on the derivatives of, the, of this renormalized potential in the following way. So it's a function of phi and x. So this gradient this a gradient and phi. So this gradient becomes a function of x. Uh, so this is in fact bounded by this renormalized coupling constant. And similarly, you can get a bound on the Hessian. I guess this should be squared. Um, um, okay, so Let's see um, why that is uh, true. Um, and then we'll see that this, uh, we've basically checked the um, condition for the um, criterion for the Luxembourg-Leff inequality that I, that I presented in, in the second lecture. Oh, sorry, there's a couple of questions. Uh, oh, no. Um, that was from earlier. OK, so uh, let's see why this is true. Um, um, okay, so I mean, okay, this is not, I mean, this proof is just, uh, I mean, you uh, plug the estimates in, right? But let's do it. Um, so let's say, let's look at uh, Vt of phi um, divided, and uh, I'll divide by omega epsilon. So this is just the, um, um, let's say the number of points uh, in, uh, in omega. Uh, this, this may not be the most, okay, anyway, let, it, it doesn't really matter. Let's just do it like this. Um, so this is bounded by some n is equal from zero to infinity. Uh, then we have the one over n factorial. Then we have the bounds on these VTs, uh, just bounding all sums. Uh, um, uh, we uh, get one factor of omega epsilon because remember in these estimates, one argument had a supremum rather a sum 
and the other ones we bound by sums here, these sums. So the first term gives us factor omega epsilon, the other ones just give us um, no, no, no additional factor. And then this whole thing is bounded by n to the n minus two times uh, um, uh, zt to the n uh, plus the constant times the constant to the n. And uh, this e to the i is just bounded by one. So we just get this is bounded by n to the n minus two times uh, c beta uh, zt uh, to, the, to the n. And uh, now uh, we can just use that um, n to the n divided by n factorial is, is bounded by e to the n, right? It's just one term appearing in the exponential and uh, the expansion of e to the n, right? So, um, so we can use that to see that this is uh, just bounded by the sum from n equal to zero to infinity. Uh, and I guess, uh, so we have one over n squared C beta times um, um, let's drop, we, we don't need the n one over n squared, um, let's ignore that. Uh, so we just have, uh, let's say one over E here, and then there's a C beta, um, or I guess it's a plus E. The C beta, uh, ZT, the whole thing to the N. And so we see under the assumption that we made, this is less than one. So the sum converges uh, geometrically. Uh, and similarly, um, we can, uh, so this converges absolutely, and you see it's, it's dominated by power series. So you can also take derivatives and so on, and you have all the regularity uh, you could want. So for, so for example, if we want to take uh, the uh, gradient, um, well, in this case, we don't get this additional factor of omega because uh, where the gradient, uh, well, it fixes one point. So um, we lose one sum. And, uh, but the estimate is otherwise similar. So maybe we get n to the, uh, I mean, we, we basically get the, same, get, get the same. And this sum is, let's say, we assume this is not less than one, but less than a half. Uh, then this is also bounded by uh, ZT and the same holds uh, for the Hessian. Uh, okay, so this is a, is a good break. Uh, no, it's not a good break. It's a good uh, time to take a break. And, um, um, and then after the break, uh, we'll, we'll continue uh, uh, with the proof of, I mean, observing that we've proved the Luxobolev inequality and also consider the two, uh, well, what remains, which is first, um, okay, we'll do whatever needs to be done after the break and I'll explain it then. <laughs> All right, thanks. Are there questions at this point? Uh, yeah, may I ask a question? Just the computational one. Um, yes. Uh, just at some point I lost track. Uh, how did you bound the summation and the indices J and K? And, uh, and when uh, you have- the... Here, uh, no, here. Um, yeah, yeah, on the, uh, when, when you bound the, yeah, exactly, when you bound the V tilde T, yeah. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I went through this a little bit fast, but, um, um, so basically the kind of expression you have, let me, let me write this in red, let's suppose the sets I1 and I2 both have two elements in it, mm -hmm. right, so then uh, what we have is C dot of, uh, let's say, we have terms which roughly look like this, x1, x2. Then we have a v tilde s, say, x1, x3. And then we have a v tilde s, x2, x4. So th those terms roughly look like this. I mean, so, the, so maybe this was j, maybe I should call them j and k for better recognition. So then we need to have a j, oops a J here and a K there, right? And then we have some other, um, uh, some other uh, uh, well, P, Q. Mm -hmm. um, 
So now we want to take the sum over all um, uh, over. So we so we have uh, basically four points, right? So J, K, P, and Q are uh, so J, K, P, Q are in one through four, right? So four points. Uh, so we're taking we're we're taking the soup over any one of these four points and the sum over the remaining ones. Um, so you can see that when you take the uh, soup over, let's say uh, this one, and then you sum over that one, then you can take the soup over the xj, sum over the xj, uh, xk, take the soup over this one, sum over that one. It's a bit fast, but I mean, this is the L1, L infinity bound. If you take the soup over one and the sum over all other ones, you bound it by, by this. Not sure I was... Um, if you if you try to sit down and, and do this, uh, I think it would be obvious. Um, it, it may be a little bit. Uh, uh, I didn't explain this in the best way, I suppose, but um, I, I don't know. Is, is, okay. is it a little bit clearer now, or? Yes, yes. I think I see okay. how it goes. Thank you. Okay. I also have a question. So, if I understand correctly, for any value n bigger than two, you don't use any nice property of the semigroup anymore, but you just trash it by bounding it by one. Exactly. So this, this won't work anymore if beta is bigger than 4 pi. But up to 4 pi, really, the estimate is extremely crude. Okay. You don't need to use anything. I mean, yeah. But you use it for n equal to 1, right? Yes, you use it for n is equal to 1. And then if beta is less than 4 pi, you don't need it for the higher ones. If uh, beta is, um, uh, is less than 6 pi, You'll need it up to the fourth uh, coefficient. I mean, you need to make use of it up to the fourth coefficient. Okay. And in principle, this should go on, but uh, um, um, it's okay. I I don't know how. I mean, um, uh, that that's an, an open question. How how to how to do that in here. Mm -hmm. In, in this uh, framework. I mean, there's other methods, of course, that uh, you know, can be used to construct the uh, sine Gordon model where you, uh, that in some sense, see the thresholds uh, that, so for example, this Dimmer-Kurt method, it doesn't really see the thresholds. Um, it works up to eight pi in the same way up as it does up to four pi. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that has uh, conceptually that that maybe uh, has some advantages, but it it get, provides weaker estimates than what we need. You you uh, with that method it it uses in a much stronger way that uh, you know the tip what the typical size of the field is and uh, and and that helps in the estimates. While well, we need a uniform bound on the Hessian, mm -hmm. and um, um, so for that it's. Uh, we use this uh, in some sense older approach, but it's much more explicit and we can see that, that we get what we need. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, but it, it would indeed be very interesting uh, if, um, so, so we do, as I'll explain after the break, we can go up to six pi where we basically do the next uh, term explicitly as well. And I, I try to sketch this briefly. You'll see uh, things become more subtle, but still work out. Uh, they're not bounded in the same way, but the Hessian is still okay. That's, that's somehow the point. Um, in fact, up to 8 pi uh, for that term. But uh, we don't have a systematic way for this uh, to um, go up to um, uh, 8 pi. And, and it, would be, uh, it would be interesting if, um, if the methods that um, AJ, Martin, and Howe um, uh, have for the dynamical case would also be useful here. I'm not, not sure. but um, mm -hmm. Okay, are there more questions at this point? If not, perhaps we make a break until quarter past. Is that right? So ten minute break. Uh, yeah, that's 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 fine. And then yeah. Okay, so uh, before the break, uh, we derived um, estimates on the effective potential under certain conditions, and um, uh, so now now we want so and and though that that. Essentially, we have, uh, un under the uh, assumption of small coupling constant, we've essentially already verified the um, uh, 
uh, assumption of this uh, general theorem for the log Sobolev inequality, which we uh, discussed in lecture two. We want, so here we need a lower bound on the uh, renormalized um, uh, potential uh, sandwiched by two heat kernels on the left and right. And uh, then we can express the log Sobolev, uh, we can bound the log Sobolev constant in terms of this integral. And, and so that'll allow us to prove, um, uh, complete the proof of um, of um, of part of this theorem. Well, we still have an, uh, uh, the uh, under the condition that beta is less than four pi rather than six pi, and under this additional uh, under this uh, smallness assumption here, we'll be able to complete the proof. Uh, we'll do that first, and then afterwards I'll show you how to get rid of this assumption uh, to get to arbitrary parameters at at the expense of uh, an L-dependent um, constant. Uh, and then finally, if time permits, I'll also comment on what, what's different if you want to go up to six pi. Uh, okay, so, um, okay, so here we are. Um, so, so note that, um, this uh, ZT, which uh, this renormalized coupling constant was defined as epsilon LT to the uh, two minus uh, beta over four pi times uh, Z. Uh, and so this is, uh, and if you remember what LT was, LT was uh, maybe one maximum square root T uh, minimum um, one over epsilon squared M squared, um, uh, no square. So it's always less than uh, one over epsilon m. So, so we can bound the whole thing from above by m to the minus two plus uh, beta over four pi z. And this is the same condition we saw in the theorem. We want this to be small enough. So this had to be multiplied by this constant c beta. If this is less than uh, if this is small enough, and otherwise, in other words, then the previous the theorem uh, from the previous theorem is applicable for all t. Um, um, so the last corollary um, uh, provides uh, the required. Estimates uh, uh, for under this condition. Uh, so uh, for all t, uh, when uh, m to the minus two plus beta over four pi z is small enough. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, so uh, if I, um, so in, in particular, we get uh, under this condition, we get the log Sobolev constant. So let beta less than four pi, um, z m to the minus beta, by less than delta. So log Sobolev constant satisfies a, it's is is at least m squared plus order z m to the beta over four pi, and in particular it's independent of l. It's uniform in the volume under this assumption. So for small coupling, large mass or high temperature, if you like, uh, we get an estimate that's. Um, independent of the volume. And so, so again, so as I said before, there's not, nothing really to do uh, for this theorem because we've, uh, uh, it's, it's basically just, we, we just recall the conditions essentially. So what we need to bound is, uh, is the Hessian of VT sandwiched by these two heat kernels. Now these heat kernels, uh, they only help. They're bounded by one. 
So we may in fact drop them. And, uh, and for, for beta less than four pi, that's enough. Uh, for beta up to six pi, we need them. But up to four pi, really, we can just bound them by e to the minus m uh, by the heat kernel by one. And we just keep this, uh, uh, this um, m dependent factor, which is, um, um, maybe there's a two here. Um, helpful. So we want to bound this by mu dot t times the identity. Um, and uh, we have that with a mu dot t uh, given by um, z t divided by l t squared. That was just because of the way I st stated the estimate uh, um, that was on the left hand side. And uh, now we have the integral from um, zero to t of mu dot s ds is equal to integral from zero to t of um, zs um, e to the minus m squared sun squared s uh, ds over ls. So in fact, uh, keeping this uh, scale factor on the left hand side is, is in fact a good idea because this measure here is uh, is approximately scale invariant, right? This is essentially ds over s, which is the scale invariant measure and this makes a lot of computations uh, convenient if you, I mean, it's not apparent in, in now, but if you do these computations, it's usually um, uh, convenient to normalize with respect to the scale invariant measure for this. So, so here, uh, what we'll see is, uh, I'm not gonna do the computation, but um, it's just bounded by zt. So, and, and now you, you um, uh, okay, so, uh, now we'll have to pay the price uh, that I uh, normalized in this lattice normalization rather than the, uh, uh, for most of you, perhaps more natural continuum normalization uh, to uh, cancel two factors of epsilon. Uh, which which I artificially introduced and canceled, but anyway. Um, so uh, our, our A has uh, is bounded from below by epsilon squared m squared. Um, if you did it this in the continuum normalization, it would just be m squared um, and uh, into the account that the Dirichlet form uh, but the Dirichlet form also has uh, factors of uh, epsilon in it. Um, uh, so in the lattice approximation, this is, is pretty natural. It, it basically, uh, this one over epsilon squared has the interpretation that we're looking at a system which from the lattice point of view is near critical. So the M is uh, scaled by epsilon square, epsilon. So it's, it's very close to critical, which would be M zero. And uh, so um, the Lux Oberlef constant will, will scale in this uh, length scale uh, squared uh, fashion, which, which you would also, which, which is typical for near critical systems. Um, so we find um, one over gamma is zero. And, and that is the, the required estimate. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so much for that. Um, next, so, so we've uh, derived this corollary. Next, I want to explain how to, uh, how to remove this, this assumption at the cost of, uh, of getting an, a constant that is not in, any more independent of L. So here, this one is independent of L and uh, now I'll show you how to, um, get rid of that. Um, so for that, um, so, so then uh, if, so in other words, if m to the minus two plus beta over four pi z is not small, then uh, that series I wrote down doesn't converge for all t.
Um, but it still converges, uh, as we saw, for, for t small enough, right? But it still converges for t uh, such that um, c beta uh, zt is less than 1 over e, right? So zt. So what is that condition? Uh, so we have, uh, let's, let's find the biggest t such that this is condition is, is satisfied. We look for the biggest t such that this condition is okay. Um, so we're looking at the zt. So remember, I call this a t naught. So remember, this is by definition just epsilon lt uh, to the power of 2 uh, uh, minus a beta over 4 pi, so z. And we want this to be less than 1 over c beta times e. So maybe let's put a 2 here. Anyway, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so, what, what is, so that is equivalent to asking that um, epsilon times lt naught. So I'm just uh, bringing the z naught on the other side and uh, then uh, take, uh, bring, also bringing this uh, power to the 2 minus beta over 4 pi to the other side. So, so then uh, the condition is that epsilon times LT naught is less some, than some constant, um, uh, which I may be calling uh, L, uh, alpha naught. It's some constant which depends, constant uh, that depends on, on beta and uh, Z also. But, um, but anyway, it means that the length scale at which we the conversion the expansion stops converging is already of order one over epsilon, so it's macroscopic. So remember, one over epsilon is macroscopic. So we can still use uh, this uh, solution given by this expansion up to this macroscopic scale. And as I'll show you now, once you have controlled the effective potential up to the macroscopic scale, all the singularity of the counter term has been canceled. And from this point on, uh, uh, you can really use a very crude estimate to uh, get the um, 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 get 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 a bound on the Hessian. So, in other words, the Fourier expansion. Converges uh, up to macroscopic uh, length scales um, and at these uh, vt naught is macroscopically smooth. It has no, the counter term or the coupling constants. If, I mean, it's, a, it's given by a complicated uh, formula, but all the, in this expansion, all coefficients appearing are, um, are, are really uh, order one. They don't have any um, uh, counter terms and quotation mark in them anymore. So, so from that, we can go to general T as follows. So remember that e to the minus vt of phi was given by the Gaussian convolution. So uh, uh, from uh, with covariance ct of e to the minus v uh, naught. But similarly, uh, it's also given by taking uh, vt naught and then taking the convolution from with covariance ct minus ct naught. Um, so the gradient of vt of phi can be written uh, where we just differentiate both sides. What do we get? Well, we'll get that this is e to the plus vt of phi times the expectation ct minus ct naught, e to the minus uh, vt naught of phi plus zeta, and then gradient of vt naught of phi plus zeta. But if we look at this expression on the right-hand side for a second, uh, we notice this is just this Polchinski semigroup applied from uh, scale t naught to t, and then uh, to the function v t naught. 
Let's just um, and similarly, we can uh, obtain a formula for the Hessian. The Hessian of Vt. So, okay, let me write it down. So again, uh, you have uh, you differentiate in the same way. So you can represent the Hessian of Vt in terms of the Hessian of uh, Vt naught. And then there's a, so, so this, is, uh, this is all what would be needed for uh, if, uh, well, uh, for the gradient, we only have this term, but for the Hessian, unfortunately, the formula is uh, slightly more complicated. There's a second term, which is gradient Vt naught, Vt naught, and then we take so this is like a covariance term. With respect to this semi group. Um, but the upshot is that the right hand side involves only VT naught. Uh, and uh, And expectations, which are the semi group uh, P. But since we control uh, VT naught. Uh, we can get accrued estimates by just dropping all p's. So that's kind of like, uh, or that's in other words, uh, it's uh, saying use, we're using the maximum principle here. If we want to see it at the level of the infinitesimal equation. But uh, equivalently, we're just dropping, we're bounding all probabilities by their supremum, prima. And uh, we can do that here uh, since uh, uh, Vt naught is controlled. Um, so, For Vt naught, um, by the uh, Fourier series, we already have the following F estimates. Um, okay, so I, I can write them down, but uh, anyway, so I'm just going to write them down, uh, but. Uh, uh, maybe not uh, give a, a full argument, but uh, at this point, I think uh, uh, you um, believe how 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 this um, may work. Um, let's see, the constants may depend on a bunch of things. Um, and uh, we also have the Hessian. of Vt naught. So let's say we have an upper and a lower bound, but we only need the lower bound. So I guess these don't depend on L, um, but still on M. Um, okay, let, let, let me just write, not, not be too precise here. Um, uh, okay, so anyway, this is just what we get from that series representation. And the point is, uh, well, we can just substitute these in to uh, uh, using uh, this formula from the previous slide, uh, get a bound on the Hessian of uh, Vt. Um, and uh, so this bound is not going to be uniform in the volume anymore because uh, this is a point I, I didn't do in detail, but if you look at, so here I've emphasized that this, this constant depends on the volume. It's something like, uh, it's probably uh, just uh, L squared. There's probably factor L squared, I think, uh, um, which uh, came, I mean, if you look at how use that series to derive this estimate, you see you have to sum over the volume once to get this estimate. Um, it's not uniform in the volume. It's uniform in epsilon, but not in that uh, L. And so the resulting bound on the Hessian you get is not uniform in L anymore. It um, depends on L and also on the coupling constant in another way. But um, uh, the point is um, uh, you still get an estimate that's uniform in epsilon for all parameters. Okay, so this, um, uh, okay, so this concludes the proof um, uh, uh, under arbitrary coupling constants. So this, uh, 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 if beta is less than four pi.
So it gives the log sub 11 equality as before. But let me emphasize So it is still uniform in epsilon. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, in the remaining minutes, um, I just want to uh, hint at what goes wrong. Um, uh, if you cross the threshold uh, four pi, Not going to give the the complete argument there, but I'll uh, I'll just show I'll just show you where uh, uh, where things happen. So remember we had these uh, v uh, t's uh, depending on n arguments, and it's really just the one depending on two arguments um, um, that fails uh, between uh, four and six pi. So we're looking at this uh, VT uh, of two arguments. And uh, so this was, there was a formula um, we had for that, which was uh, e to the minus WT minus WS. So now we just have two arguments, psi one, psi two. And uh, then uh, V, so it's, pretty, it's very simple. Um, I guess they had a tilde here, psi one, V tilde S psi two. And then uh, there was this u dot s psi one psi two as well uh, ds. Uh, okay, and uh, so in fact um, you can write down an explicit formula, which is uh, you can do the integral on the right hand side. This this we know explicitly what it is. It's just this uh, the one where it depends on one variable, and the, the uh, this coefficient was explicit. So really, what you get is. So integrating that equation, for example, you can see that this is given by um, uh, this renormalized coupling constant squared. And then you have a term, which I think was one minus e to the minus a beta sigma one, sigma two, uh, ct x one, x two. So remember xi i is uh, xi sigma i. So, okay, so far so good. So what is this? Um, uh, so let's just look at what this is. Um, so you notice there are two different cases, sigma one and sigma two are equal or they're not equal. So in other words, their product is plus one or minus one. Um, one of the cases, so in other words, the configuration of the two charges is, is either neutral or it's charged. It's, it's neutral if, if they're different and charged if they have the same charge. It's only the charged case that's problematic. In the neutral case, uh, this works out just as well as up to four pi. But the charged case, so in other words, where they're different, um, uh, then, uh, well, you have an e to the um, plus beta in the exponent times ct x1, x2. And uh, so then this is, uh, and uh, re let's remember what ct is. ct is that integrated heat kernel. So this is actually just going to be x1 minus x2 divided by lt to the power minus the beta over uh, 2 pi, I guess. And you see that this uh, additional factor you get here is singular. Uh, well, you get a factor here that's singular. The larger beta is, the more singular it is. And it turns out up to 4 pi, it's fine. Uh, you, um, um, you can still integrate it. Uh, uh, but if beta is bigger than four pi, then you see this x minus x one minus x two is, is like a non-integrable singularity, and so this term actually blows up. Um, it's not bounded in the same way as before. So, so it's easy to see from this that L t squared uh, sup x uh, sum y v t of um, say x plus one, y minus one uh, is not bounded in epsilon. 
uh, and correspondingly, uh, the contribution to the Hessian is, is not bounded in epsilon. Uh, and so Hessian uh, V2T uh, is not uh, uh, bounded. Bounded below. But remember, we don't need the hash. So V2 is, so this uh, is just the, the uh, contribution to the Hessian uh, from V associated from these two particles in the Fourier series, right? So this is the two particle contribution. Uh, but it's not the Hessian we need, it's We need QT times the Hessian of VT, and then there's a QT on the other side as well. And, um, and so, in fact, this heat kernel helps. Um, why? Well, first of all, notice that the only problematic cases are the ones where the two charges are different. Uh, so, so I haven't told you, but uh, you can trust me that if the two charges are the same, then the, everything works as in the case up to four pi. But if they're different, uh, this is singular. On the other hand, if, it, if they're different, you have an additional difference once you take the Hessian and apply it to the heat kernel. Roughly speaking, what's happening is it brings down a second derivative of the heat kernel, and that improves um, this, uh, this um, divergent sum by a factor two or something like that. Um, the upshot is once you've applied the Hessian on uh, the, the heat kernel on both sides, it's not divergent anymore. And in fact, uh, this V2 is, uh, is bounded up to eight pi. Um, so somehow this heat kernel, having this heat kernel on the left and right is extremely important. I mean, at, b beyond four pi. Um, and, um, Okay, so, so that, that's roughly how it works. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna go into more details um, um, here, but uh, you can trust me that, it, I mean, this V2 you can check uh, is, is okay once you compute this relevant quantity rather than in the more crude way that I computed it before, which was sufficient up to four pi. Um, okay, so I want to leave it at that and uh, let me just summarize that this works up to six pi this way. And it's an interesting question if one could go further. Um, and in fact, maybe I can, um, um, let me conclude with some open uh, problems. Um, um, one is, um, uh, so basically uh, what I've shown, uh, what I showed is, uh, I mean, this kind of convergence we saw up to four pi, um, people would refer to this as the convergence of the Meyer expansion. And um, so I guess uh, it's, a, it's a conjecture, I'm not quite sure who it is due, but uh, uh, that the uh, Meyer expansion uh, for the Yukawa gas converges up to um, beta less than eight pi times one minus one over two n, if the first n coefficients are subtracted. So this is what I showed you uh, for um, up to six pi and there, uh, well, I didn't show it, uh, in fact, I, uh, let me mention it. Just uh, after, the, I mean, this V2 term is problematic, but the higher ones are actually not problematic anymore. They converge in the same way as up to, uh, as, um, as up to four pi. And so in general, this is uh, believed to be true. Um, um, and so one would only have to deal with the, the lower ones if, uh, if this was known. Um, uh, and, and then also, um, um, it would be very interesting uh, to see uh, if one can uh, bound the Hessian for the continuum phi four model, um, for the lattice sine Gordon model, 
for the, so this is uh, D is equal to uh, three. Uh, lattice sign Gordon model would be uh, in the KT phase for beta bigger than eight pi. Um, uh, or the lattice, um, lattice phi four model, this would be in D uh, four or higher. Or maybe you could ask for lattice easing. Um, um, so somehow these problems are maybe an increasing difficulty. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so I think I'm, I'm uh, 10 minutes early or so, but uh, I think I, I've said what I wanted to uh, explain. And uh, since I was the last speaker, I, I should, uh, uh, oh, there's a question. Uh, uh, for lattice easing, this is known. Oh no, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, far from known. Um, I mean, there's nothing. Uh, um, um, so, uh, okay, I'm talking uh, critical here. So, right, oops. High temperature, of course, it's, uh, it's known, but. Um, okay, and um, okay, so anyway, let me resume where I stopped. Uh, since I'm the last speaker, uh, I uh, would like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this uh, great conference and uh, this fight, uh, and it was well worth uh, suffering through, or not suffering, but uh, enjoying uh, many hours of Zoom, <laughs> even if, uh, um, if your eyes are tired at the end of the day. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's uh, give a round of applause to uh, Hendrik and Andres. <laughs> <laughs> also, round of applause for Roland for fantastic words, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so perhaps we should uh, first say, ask if there were still questions for Roland, uh, because he kind of dodged that by uh, by thanking us. <laughs> right, so what? Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, so it's, um, uh, you know, I'm still kind of on the Bakri and Marie stuff. So um, from what you just said several minutes ago, when you kind of get this compensation for singularity right from the heat kernel, yes. the second derivative. Uh, do you think that maybe instead of Bakrimer, you could use something like Lapunov type arguments because they, so quite often people would like in Langevin dynamics with single potentials, people would use it instead of this because it's sometimes easier to guess what you should put like perturbation of the invariant measure type argument, which gives you the Lapunov function, which would control this kind of thing. I'm just curious because philosophically, it's more or less equivalent to Bakri and Marie, but not completely. Um, well, it's, uh, I mean, okay, from my perspective, um, um, I mean, so what we want, what we are exploiting here is that we have a very good understanding of the invariant measure. And uh, so somehow uh, that's what we want to use. I mean, of course you can try to use the dynamics directly, but uh, it's not what we do, right? And I mean, you need to use something non-trivial non and, uh, and uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not sure how to answer your question, but um anyway, thanks. I mean it's it's I mean you need to cancel the so I mean there's these singularities, right? And you need to cancel that somehow, right? And of course there are other possibilities you that you could imagine how, how to do that, but um anyway, um uh, maybe I'll tell you offline what I meant. 
because I have a very concrete thing in mind. So I have a question, if uh, if I may. Uh, yes. So um, this is a little bit, maybe more a philosophical question about uh, the general strategy. Is that uh, here to me? Is, it, it it seems that uh, it's very important that you're you're trying to renormalize now to to transform your original potential, which is not nice, into a nice potential, uh, and and somehow for the nice potential. Uh, you know that back the emery works, and that this is basically why uh, the, 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 the whole strategy works. But uh, I was thinking if, if there is some sort, sort of way to do the same, trying to go to transform your bad potential into a good potential for which you know that logs of levy inequality holds, but not because of back the emery, but because of another resource. Like, uh, for, for example, now you, you prove that the logs of lev uh, holds for a bunch of measures. And maybe down you can try to use these measures as uh, as your uh, target measures of another renormalization or something like that. I mean, it's I mean, in principle, there's a lot of things one could imagine to do. I mean, the I think the physical picture is I mean, we agree, uh, you know very well, it is very clear, right? The small scales relax fast and uh, the large scales are slow, right? And somehow we want to use that, I mean, once if we want to estimate, say, the Loxobolev constant or any other um, quantity that, mac that measures the long time um, relaxation, uh, we want to mostly see the large scales, right? And uh, the small scales should be slow anyway. Now, um, the problem is we have these singularities at small scales, which, and, and they couple to everything, and they, they um, so it, it's hard to, implement this and uh, I mean um, so uh, I mean uh, well as you know when you do these uh, estimates say for the Loxobolev constant or something else it's uh, um, it, it's uh, it's delicate to couple the different scales right you can get you can very easily get big errors in, in doing this and we found that this continuous way of doing this was extremely uh, I mean it worked much better than anything else we, we've seen um, uh, for, for this, right? Because somehow by doing it continuously, you need to control a bit more um, the potential, but, uh, but then, um, um, uh, then somehow the, the steps in, in between scales become uh, are for free. Um, I'm not sure if this, I mean, I think I've maybe not exactly answered your question, but... Uh, um, yeah, I mean it's okay. It's more like I mean, like, so like, somehow, um, 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 okay. I, I don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's something that works. Uh, in, 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 in this example, which I think is uh, uh, sufficiently non-trivial that, uh, um. To illustrate that, I mean, I, I wouldn't see any other way how to uh, how to do this this example, uh, the continuum sine Gordon model. So, if anyone has another way, um, that would be interesting. More questions? Perhaps not. So then, before we close and end the whole thing, let me just make two or three more announcements. So, first of all, as I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, the, 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 we were going to actually hold this event live in Bath in September and then due to, the, uh, due to COVID we couldn't do this but there will be a catch-up event which hopefully will take pl place live in Bath next year from the 1st to the 10th of September and it would be great to see many of you there. Um, uh, second, th uh, um, second thing I wanted to say is a thanks of course to the speakers. I think all four speakers are very grateful that they gave these very nice lectures. Um, but also perhaps I want to say thanks to Andreas Capriano and Leif Döring uh, from the, uh, from who have set up this One World Probability Platform and they have been actually super helpful in, in organizing this event and giving us loads of uh, helpful events. And the same is true for Jean-Christophe Moura who has been uh, very involved in thinking about optimal ways of delivering things like that. And I mean, many of his, his suggestions we didn't implement in the end, but these discussions were very helpful for us. 
Um, and then finally, I would like to say, so I mean, I think it's actually a nice format and perhaps even worth doing something similar when once COVID is over. And uh, for that, if you have any suggestions on how we can do things much, much better or, um, or a little bit better, then could you just let us know by either sending, sending an email to the conference web, pay, web email, conference email or just to us directly. And um, yeah, so I think, I think that's it to everybody. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Yes, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks, yeah. Thanks for everyone to sticking out to the end. And uh, I hope to see you all in real life at some point soon. Okay, so I just stop. Okay. Thanks okay. to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.